I was planning to make the joke about having a joke, but uh, no, it's all right. Yere already stole stole it. Um, so no jokes. Monte Carlo methods for expensive models based on repulsive point processes. So this is going to be a fairly theoretical talk, but it's actually it actually has its origins in my uh, time in Oxford back in 2013, 2014. I was working with Dave Gavigan's and uh, Gary Myram's group, and uh, I realized uh, I was the I was helping with the statistics, and I realized that the models that these people were facing were actually quite different from the models that we had in mind. Uh, at least in the MCMC community, we have in mind models that you can evaluate a million times in a row sequentially. And uh, the models that Gary and Dave were actually using required to solve large systems of differential equations. And for the larger of these models, this could actually mean waiting for a minute or several minutes before actually evaluating your likelihood once. So of course, evaluating you know one million minutes is a lot of time. And it's uh, an amount of time that uh, you were that these uh, collaborators were not willing to wait, um, which is one of the reasons why you actually build emulators. But then I started to think, okay, what what is actually wrong with our Monte Carlo methods? Essentially, what's wrong? Uh, does that work? Yes. Sorry, these are the faces of the people that uh, this talk is going to be based on, and. Uh, the, the most important co collaborator here is the one in the middle, Ayub Belaji, uh, whose thesis is, uh, contains the material that I'm going to present today. And one of the things that was wrong is the following. So if I want to integrate f with respect to uh, some measure dmu, so think of uh, dmu of having a, as having a density with respect to dx, with respect to Lebesgue. So omega of x is the posterior of your model, and f of x is the function that you want to integrate. And uh, a Monte Carlo method is basically a discretization of this, uh, an, a discrete integration rule with uh, n evaluations of f at points, which I will call the nodes. And you have weights, uh, what I call weights are the wi's here in green in this formula. And basically, Monte Carlo integration is about sampling the xi's from some distribution and then computing the weights wi's as a function of xi, possibly also depending on the position of the other quadrature nodes. And the typical error, the root mean square error, is in 1 over square root of n. So the number of evaluations of your likelihood n transpires here as uh, is uh, in this convergence speed in w as 1 over square root of n. So of course, this is very, very slow. If, uh, I mean, this one over square root of n is the main problem when, when the budget is n, when evaluating the likelihood is actually your bottleneck. So, okay, it seemed uh, we should be able to do better than one over square root of n. Uh, one of the things that we would like not to abandon is the fact that usually uh, the constant above here is actually something that scales very nicely with the dimension not for important sampling, but one of the theoretical reasons that MCMC actually works well in large dimensions is because the constant above there only increases polynomially with the dimension. So that's something that we would like to retain, something that we really like in Monte Carlo integration. And one of, one of the reasons we're actually using these random nodes instead of deterministic ones is that these constants here tend to have more uh, a clearer mathematical meaning and to be and you can estimate them usually with, with some, some uh, there's actually estimates of these constants. So you can have confidence intervals on the evaluation of your integral, for example. So that's Monte Carlo methods. And uh, OK, we realize that the bottleneck is this 1 over square root of n. There's a whole class of integration algorithms out there called quasi Monte Carlo integration algorithms. And they are basically giving you guarantees of the following sort. So they will tell you. Oh, if you have to integrate f with respect to dmu, I will give you a deterministic sequence of xi's and weights wi's such that you can control this integration error uniformly over a large class of functions, which I call calligraphic f. So this is better. Let me go back to the previous slide. The previous slide basically says whatever f with very loose assumptions, I, I can guarantee this. Already, if you want to guarantee if you have only one sample of the xi's and you want to guarantee uh, and you want a confidence interval in your integrals for several functions of f, 
you already need to think. This is something that we rarely do in Monte Carlo, but if you had a million functions f that you wanted to integrate, then you would have to correct for using uh, the same xi's to estimate each f. That's the nice thing about quasi Monte Carlo is that they say, okay, I will give you a single sequence of xi's, you evaluate f at these xi's, and I give you a guarantee for every function on my function class f. The guarantee looks nice, it's in 1 over n instead of 1 over square root of n, okay, so you could uh, you could say that's that's going to be that's going to converge faster. The problem is this blue term here in the numerator. This log n to the s minus one. Sorry, s is the dimension here uh, where x lives. So this bound here, it it looks like it's one over n up to log terms. But this function here does not decrease in n before n is actually exponential of s. So this bound doesn't tell you anything interesting until the number of points is just uh, enough to make a very coarse grid. And that's, in, in Bayesian inference at least, that's not the regime that's interesting. You want your integration algorithm to work with a number of points that's not exponential in the dimension. If your dimension is 20, 30, 100, then this is going to be impractical. So the bounds asymptotically look nice, but they actually only even decrease after n is actually intractably large. So I was trying to think uh, of something in between. I want something random. I want all the benefits of randomness. I want the easily explainable bounds. I want the bounds to be estimable. And I want faster convergence, a bit like QMC. I want something that converges faster than square root of n. And so we've made a couple of attempts in this direction. And I'm going to tell you about one of these attempts. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume, haha, uh, let me go back one slide. I hate to do this, actually. Uh, but uh, the, uh, something that I, have, uh, that I have forgotten to tell you is that these classes of functions for which you can actually guarantee this actually assume a lot of, a lot of smoothness from f. So one of the keys to getting fast speeds, and maybe you can already feel it, is having smooth functions. If the function doesn't vary much, I'm going to be able to represent the function by a, f a smaller number of samples. So this is what we're going to do afterwards. I'm going to assume a lot of smoothness from f, and then I'm going to try to integrate the functions in this kind of spaces. RKHS means reproducing kernel Hilbert space. You've, we've actually seen a couple of these spaces uh, during the conference. There were some in Marina's talk, I think, but maybe they were implicit only. But I'm going to define them explicitly. But think of this as a space of functions that are very, very smooth. And I'm going to try and take the smoothness of that function to optimize the way the nodes are distributed. So they're still going to be randomly distributed, but I'm going to try to spread them very efficiently across the space so as to be able to integrate functions in that space uniformly well and very fast. So I'm going to try to come up with super efficient Monte Carlo methods, if you want. So if you're integrating a posterior on the parameters of, of a model, I'm going to try to find uh, model parameters that actually cover the space of parameters very well. You can think we've seen experimental designs this morning. We've seen the experimental designs, I think, even in Chris's talk. Uh, and you're going to see something that actually resembles this. So I'm going to do, I'm going to take the experimental designs and force them into quadrature rules. So let's see how this works. So I need to define these uh, spaces of smooth functions. So an RKHS, reproducing kernel, Hilbert space, is just take a kernel k, so take a function of two inputs, x and y. Both of them live in the, in the space on which you want to evaluate integrals. So this uh, kappa, sorry, kappa of xy. And you take linear sums of uh, alpha i times these kappas that you center of, at xi. And you look at this kappa of xi dot as a function of its second variable. So think of kappa as being a Gaussian. Kappa is just exponential minus the norm of x minus y squared. Then this is just a weighted sum of Gaussians centered at different places xi. I authorize myself positive and negative weights. I don't care. But these are just sums of Gaussians with a bunch of different centers. So these are smooth functions. And then I'm going to declare that I know how to compute the inner product between these sums, and I want the inner product to satisfy this. 
So I want, I'm just going to put as a condition on Kappa that, is for example, uh, that it, for example, uh, satisfies the rules of inner products, but I'm going to impose this. And this bilinearity tells me how to compute the, the inner product between two such sums. Now that I know how to compute the inner product, I have a norm that's coming with this inner product. And I'm just going to make sure that every Cauchy sequence here actually converges. So I'm going to complete that space. It's going to be easier for me to do analysis in this complete space. So I'm just taking limits of these sums of Gaussians, if you want. <laughs> now, this is one way of seeing these spaces. They're limits of sums of, fun of functions kappa here, which I call features. If you're familiar with the literature on support vector machines in machine learning, those are called feature functions. If not, just think of kappa being a Gaussian centered at, X, at xi. So I'm taking all these sums and I'm making the space slightly bigger by making, making sure that I have convergent Cauchy sequences. There's another way of seeing these spaces that is actually interesting in, that is useful in understanding in what, in what sense the functions f here are smooth. Basically, under very general assumptions, there is a measure mu such that my f that I built here is in L2 of d mu. It's dense there, so it actually, you can uh, find a sequence of functions in f that converges to any function in L2. So it's, it's well spread in L2. And there's an orthonormal basis En of L2 and a sequence sigma n converging to zero, such that I have the following equality. And uh, what that means is actually this is me decomposing this kernel kappa in the basis of the ENs. So this is diagonalization of the kernel. Why am I insisting on this? Because if you have such a decomposition of the kernel, so there's a sequence of, say, eigenvalues sigma n that decreases to zero, and eigenfunctions en, then you can describe this RKHS, this uh, space of smooth functions, by requiring that the inner product of f with these ENs, think of en as cosinus of cos cosine of nx. So you want the Fourier coefficients of f in modulus to decay very fast. And by very fast, I mean they should decay fast enough that even if I multiply them by 1 over sigma n, this sum still converges. And remember that sigma n is converging to 0. So the, the Fourier coefficients of f have to decay even faster than this for this sum to make sense. If your Fourier coefficients decay fast, you're smooth. In that sense, the functions in my calligraphic f are actually smooth, and the smoothness is governed by the kernel kappa. In what sense? Well, if I have the eigen decomposition of the kernel, so this generalized Fourier decomposition, then I can control, I should be able to control the, the generalized Fourier coefficients of f. So one example of such a space is actually actually comes from taking En to be the cosine of Nx and uh, taking sigma n to be 1 over n to some power. Then you end up with what's called periodic Sobolev spaces that you might have encountered in numerical analysis. So it's just spaces, it's just the space of functions, the, co the Fourier coefficients of which are decreasing uh, polynomially. So it's smooth functions because the Fourier coefficients decrease fast, and you can control the degree of smoothness by controlling the degree of the polynomial that uh, forces your Fourier coefficients to decay. OK, so we have a space of smooth functions. And the, the smoothness of the functions is actually described by this kappa of xi. So let's try and use this kappa of xi to spread the points that uh, are going to integrate the functions in f. In order to do this, I need two more remarks. The first one is the following. Basically, if you're trying to integrate f in f, and there's an additional degree of freedom, you can also have this g in L2 here. But if you don't want this additional freedom, just think of g equals to 1. Then the integral of f d mu minus the Monte Carlo approximation, I'm just going to apply Cauchy-Schwarz in my, uh, in my Hilbert space, RKHS, and RKHS is a Hilbert space. So I'm applying Cauchy-Schwarz. This decomposes as the norm of f times this pink term here, which is just how well do I approximate this mu g 
which is defined by this integral of this instrumental g times my feature function. How well do I approximate this new g called the mean element of g? It's a way of embedding any g in L2 in my RKHS. How well do I approximate it with my uh, weighted sum of feature functions? Five, all right. That's very useful because this means that I can bound my integration error by this interpolation error by how well I approximate new g. Now, if I have the nodes xi, finding the wi's is actually easy. It's enough to solve a linear problem to actually find the optimal wi's. And this all comes from the fact that I've imposed my norm to be the norm between k of x dot and k of y dot to be k of xy. If, then, if you use this trick, called the reproducing trick, to uh, write down what that means, you'll see that the wi's that minimize this actually solve a linear prob problem. There's actually more to this, because, because this is a norm in a Hilbert space, the, the optimal weights w ha wi hats actually are, uh, make this, this sum, the orthogonal projection of mu g onto the span of these feature functions. My k of x1 dot, etc., k of x n dot, they're all in my space f. And I want the best linear combination of them to approximate this mu g. So that's actually the orthogonal projection by definition of mu g onto the span of these functions. Now, how do you choose the nodes xi, right? It's, it's enough that I choose the nodes xi to make this projection in pink small, and then I will control the integration error of every function of, say, bounded norm f. So now I'm going to try and do this. How can I do that? I know how to find the weights once I have the nodes. It's enough to find the nodes. I want functions in my RKHS to project onto this and have a small residual. What's a good way to do this? I need functions. I need to choose my xi such that k of xi dot is actually close to as many functions in, uh, in f as possible. And mu g, because of this uh, decomposition of the kernel on the previous slide, mu g, most mu g's are actually close to the first eigenfunctions of the kernel. So the, what I'm going to try and do is to find kappa, kappa try to find x such that, such that kappa of x dot is close to the span of the first eigenfunctions of the kernel. Collectively, you also want all these feature functions to be as diverse as possible because Taking two kappa of x dot that are close to each other doesn't really reduce the error of the projection. You're projecting onto almost the same vector, then you're spending your budget in a stupid way. You should actually choose your directions here, your kappa of x dot, as orthogonal as possible so as to make the projections, the space on which you project, as big as possible. One way to measure this is actually to do de experimental design and actually take your x1 up to xn so that this, the, say, the parallelotope all right, that is built on these vectors is, has a large volume. And this volume is actually measured by the determinant. This is actually the same rational that in the experimental design. So if I want to have a small projection, then I should try and make this determinant here large. Then my feature vectors will span as big a box as possible, and my projection in pink will be small. And that's exactly what we did. So if you sample your nodes, your Monte Carlo nodes, proportionally to this determinant, then you end up with a point process that looks like this. So you end up with points that look more, that fill the space more evenly than if you were drawing them independently. There's actually, a, don't try to understand what's on the marginal axis, just uh, look at these points here. Because of the orthonormal basis that I took here to diagonalize the kernel, you have accumulations of points at the border, because at the border, the two functions that are indexed by an x which is close to the border are actually almost orthogonal, just as orthogonal as two functions that are here. So this is, we were discussing this outside a couple of minutes before my talk. This is a way of making really the, the strength of the repulsion between the points depending on really the smoothness of functions in that space. And basically, this second plot is just the same as the first plot, but where I add the weights. So blue is positive, orange is negative. This is just to remind you that I will actually weight this set of points. And if you do this, this is the final theorem. So 
draw my points according to this, proportionally to this volume spent by the corresponding feature functions, solve the linear program for the weights, and you control the approximation error, which is itself an upper bound to the integration error. So I will integrate my function as well as sigma n times 1 plus a constant. So sigma n is actually the order of convergence of my Monte Carlo method. Sigma n is the nth Single, the nth eigenvalue of my kernel. This is actually the best I can hope for. This barbaric result here just says that the best you can hope for if you're trying to project functions in a space onto a space of dimension n, this is going to be sigma n plus 1. So I have the optimal rate of convergence for my Monte Carlo error. If sigma n converges exponentially fast, meaning my functions are super, super smooth, my Monte Carlo method converges exponentially fast. If I'm working in a sub aleph space, so sigma n is decreasing polynomially fast as 1 over m to the n to the s, then my Monte Carlo method converges at the, the exact same speed. And this is the best I can hope for in this worst case sense. So there are at least spaces of functions, smooth functions, where I can guarantee that I integrate functions as fast as possible, I reach this lower bound with the Monte Carlo method. And I have a bound that is actually only a feature of the eigenvalues of the kernel describing the space. So this is one of, we've preserved the niceness at least of the bounds in, in Monte Carlo. How are you going to estimate this if you don't know the eigen decomposition of the kernel is another matter. How you're going to, this can be sampled in polynomial time if you know the eigen decomposition. If you don't know the eigen decomposition, we still believe we can approximately sample this, but whether we're going to be able to sample it at this level of precision is, uh, is still an open question. But that's, uh, that's basically it. More smoothness, faster convergence, and we can find an intermediate between Monte Carlo and quasi Monte Carlo that still retains the niceness of the bounds of Monte Carlo, but actually adapts to the smoothness of the function and adapts to the point of reaching the lower bound. So I think that's, that's really nice. Monte Carlo methods can be super fast if you restrict the smoothness and you adapt the way you spread the nodes in the space exactly to that smoothness. That's the, that's the bottom line. Now, whether this is practically relevant for biological inference is uh, also an open question that I'd be happy to discuss. These spaces are very nice theoretical tools because you can control a lot of properties of the functions you integrate, but I would be happy to, uh, to, uh, to chat with someone who has an application where the, the integrand, and that actually in includes the posterior, in, if you're trying to do inference, actually belongs to a known RKHS, known in the sense of having a known kernel. Thanks. Great talk. Do we have questions for a speaker? Okay, if there are no... Okay, there's one. Great. Let me... Sorry. Thanks. Great talk. Um, the, the, the weights, are they um, they're also negative, right? Yes. So what's the linear program you have to solve again? Uh, let me come back. It's minimizing this here. So it's actually the, the matrix you have to inverse is kappa of x i x j, the drum matrix okay, of the kernel. Okay, so... And you can guarantee that if you draw points from proportionally to the determinant, the matrix is going to be positive definite. It's even going to be very well conditioned. So the W is chosen based on the... Um, on the on, other points as well. On the measure and G? Uh, yes. Not on the, the function that you're trying to integrate. No, the yeah. Yeah, yeah, the G is, the, is where you're dependent on, the, on what you're trying to integrate. Okay. The so rest I mean, you make it uniform. Having negative weights is... Uh, can you also like estimate derivatives? I mean, I, why would you ever do that? But uh, I mean, having negative weights has a certain feeling that you may also be able to, you know, I mean, how would you numerically estimate a derivative at a point? Like you take the difference of the function at two points. You the can derivative estimate. of f. Or yeah. Why would you do it like this? But it seems there's like something, I, I, I don't quite 
see the negative weight, um, like my intuition sort of breaks down. I mean, it's uh, just just a comment. Uh, it's a, a yeah, 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 it's an interesting point. Uh, I mean, you should be able to. You should be able to estimate derivatives. I know. I'll, I'll think about it. We, we can definitely get. We can try and work with positive weights only, but we've only been able to prove rates like one over n to the one plus one over d. Yeah, yeah. It's like this this kind of classical classical rates. If you want to have optimal kernel quadrature, it seems that you need to have these uh, to need to have these signs in. So has anyone like had a an application where there's one of these reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces coming in naturally? I've seen at least in, in PDE models, like sometimes people have coefficients that vary and they want to uh, they want to assume, for example, that the function that the coefficient has a is belongs to some sub of space because it guarantees that the whole PDE has some solution of in a certain sense. But cases where the actual posterior or the, even the likelihood actually belongs to an RKHS, it's it's rare. Or maybe non-existing. Yeah, um, it reminds me of stuff we used to do with adaptive finite element stuff, but there you're in control of the basis, so you choose it to give you an order of accuracy. So it all reminds you, and all the yes. notation everything yes. is very, very similar. Yes. But I just don't have enough of a feel to be able to answer your question at the moment. It reminds me of it all, so maybe we should just have a yeah, chat yeah, afterwards, yeah, because yeah. I think it would be a cross-purpose at the moment, but it takes me back, you know. 15 years when we, do and when we were doing adaptive finite element methods in a, for a very similar sort of problem. Without we're trying to solve PDEs, as you say. Um, but if you think of it as being an elliptic PDE, it's a very similar problem. I mean, when we get onto parabolic or time-dependent problems, it's quite different. So that's what my question was, actually. So how could you link this back to time-dependent problems? I can see how we can do... I can see the equivalence with PDE problems in steady state, where you're just doing an integral. But when you've got time dependence, where does that come in? Mm. Maybe so you're, maybe I, I'm understanding the problem wrongly, but the, how I would relate this back to what we were doing is yeah. that my uh, my mu would be the posterior in some model, and I'm just interested in I don't know if you want to find the posterior median, then you want to integrate you know an absolute value with respect to this posterior. So the time actually doesn't come in the design of the nodes. You can, though, but it's uh, in for, for different reasons. For example, I'm interested in having time-dependent repulsive point processes because I want to get back this polynomial dependence on the dimension of the error. So what MCMC brings you compared to independent sampling is the fact that uh, the, the asymptotic variant doesn't blow up with the dimension. Here, it does. it's in a sense controlled by this decay of sigma, but if you're really in large dimensions, these sigma will actually also blow up. So you need to introduce some kind of Monte Carlo chain, that Markov chain that leaves this distribution, this repulsive distribution invariant, and then you need to average across time and space. This is, this is what I'm actively trying to do and try and get back this nice uh, scaling of the dimension. But this is not related, it's not the time in the sense of the time of the ODE, it's the time, an artificial time that will buy me some variance. So that's that's the near future, and the other the other near future is to try and investigate whether this is just a nice theoretical result, just proving that you know there's something between Monte Carlo and QMC, or whether there's actually problems where there's this uh, this RKHS assumption makes sense, and it's actually quite robust. So we've uh, it, at the end of his thesis, Ayub actually proved that even if you miss the RKHS, so you you have the wrong kernel then you still do well in a sense to integrate functions that are not too far. So if you assume some decay of your Fourier coefficients, but actually the decay is slightly larger, then you don't do too badly. So it's, it's all continuous in a sense in the error that you make on these sigma n's and en's on the, on the eigen decomposition of the kernel. So it could be that maybe it's irrelevant directly, but maybe we can approximate the functions that we want to integrate by some RKHS that is handy for computation and will give us some guarantees. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's very close to methods like Galerkin or, or spectral methods. There's a lot of people working on this also, calling this mesh-free, yeah. uh, mesh-free finite element variants. So yes, we've uh, looked at this. So, but yeah, this is a, maybe this will give me at the end, maybe in the end this will give me a nice uh, application area. Yeah. We haven't found anything that was helping us in our computations and at least in these proofs, it's kind of very natural. I mean, this, you don't need much help because this, this is the residual of a linear projection. It will somehow feature some measure of collinearity of your features. I mean, think of linear regression. If you're selecting columns in a matrix, you want to select columns that are not collinear and that span a large volume. This is exactly what we're saying here. I mean, this is a, this is a very old idea, basically. So. You, here have been interested in this for a long time. So that head of department in this here is one, but Andre Suli, you might have come across Sue me. Suli, Andre Suli, uh -huh. and Nick Trefethen have worked in different aspects of this. So it might be having a, worth having a oh, look. Yeah, yeah, having it'd, a be chat. Nice to, it'd be nice yeah, to actually best. talk to, to yeah. these people and see uh, what comes up. So far, we've only just read the uh, reviews and stuff. And uh... Maybe one more question. Yeah. So when we're doing experimental design for space filling designs to build Gaussian processes, optimal design tends to put these points on the edges in the way that you've got points on the edges. Yes. Intuitively, that seems wrong. Yes. So we tend not to use optimal designs, we use more pragmatic designs. And I wonder whether you've got a comment on why optimal design puts points on edges and is that actually a useful thing, having points on edges? So it's useful if what you're interpolating is polynomials. So here, the, here what's happening is that I, in that case, my uh, feature function, the um, eigenfunctions of the kernel are actually orthogonal polynomials. And it turns out that if you look at the kernels that you build using orthogonal polynomials, when the number n goes to infinity, they all converge to the same thing. Which is, the, which is the beta one half, one half measure, which tends to, so if you look at, this is what's plotted here in the orange on these two axes. And so it's a, it's a feature of using polynomials that you will tend to have these large points here. And these points are actually important if you are doing polynomial regression, because this is basically, this is points where you want to, if you're making a small error, you will pay it largely in your polynomial interpolation. So there's actually an interest in putting points as, as far as possible from zero yeah. if you're interpolating polynomials. So, so it's, it's, sorry. it's to do with the fact you've got polynomials yes. and the most weight is at the ends of the yes. polynomials exactly. rather than... Yeah, OK, that's... Exactly. That, that if you're doing it with something else than polynomials, you won't see that effect. Yeah. But here, here it's natural for polynomials. It's slightly weird from a space feeling point of view, but if... From the point of view of, of a polynomial, these points have a large leverage. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our speaker.